illuminate our hearts and our minds today, to draw us near your word, and to study it and to understand it better. Illuminate us now as we come together with your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 44, 22. As we wrap up this series of familiar and favorite Bible verses, I called upon my youngest daughter to tell me her favorite memory verse. And Megan shared with me, which I did not know, is Isaiah 44, 22. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. As I studied the text in the coming week, I expanded the reading, as you can see, for dear Sarah, who did a fantastic job of reading all that scripture for us. But I needed all that reference or background so that you could better understand what this verse actually means. Uh, so today I will focus on Isaiah 44, specifically verses 6 through 23. To fully understand the offenses that the prophet Isaiah is referring to, so in the end, we can better understand the meaning of this favorite verse. So if you would like to follow along, uh, I'm going to begin in verse 6 in Isaiah, as God's prophet declares God saying, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. As you read this first verse, you probably think to yourself, hey, I have heard that before somewhere in the Bible. Maybe it was in Exodus 21, verse 1 in the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. Or all the way to Revelation 21, 6. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is clear that the Holy Bible points to one God. All other idols are just that. They're idols. Idolatry is a really, really broad topic. If I were to ask you to take out a pen and a paper, or in your mind, or on your cell phone, I don't want any texting in church, but if you were to have to make a list of some types of idols, I bet all of you would come up with different ideas or things. They could include obsessions with Food, money, careers, technology, sports, clubs, organizations that you belong to, the human body, fitness, alcohol, drugs that cause dependency, fasting, sex. Whatever it is, it is something that consumes our lives. And when this happens, we have no room for God. So today as we study Isaiah 44, we are given a window into Isaiah's teaching about the risks and almost the craziness of idolatry worship and where it leads God's people. One preacher I heard on this topic once described Isaiah as explaining why idolatry is a dumb idea. And I really like that. He was speaking to a youth audience, but at the time I thought, <clears throat> that's pretty funny. I, I like that approach because we can all identify with really dumb ideas in our life or foolish things that we have done. Take the last foolish thing that you bought and say, yeah, I can, I can really identify with that dumb idea. Why did I order that? Why did I buy that? A couple of years ago, I ordered a patio set online, and I loved the pictures of the set. It was perfect. It had a love seat. It had a table with a glass top. It had two chairs. It had cushions. It was affordable because I'm really tight with my money, and, and so I was sure that I had found the perfect patio set. So I clicked buy. And the dumb thing was that I did, as I did not check the measurements of the items that I had purchased, I did not read the fine print. I instead just ordered it. And when the furniture arrived, I can tell you that my family laughed and laughed and laughed as I unpacked these tiny little sets of 
the items that were included in the picture, but in much smaller sizes. The chairs were so small that none of us could, well, maybe some of the youth back there could fit in them. The love seat was like the size of a chair, and the table was, well, it was pretty tiny. To get that point across, Isaiah offers us um, things that we practice in idolatry that are just really dumb ideas. If we're asking ourselves, how did I get here? How did I end up with this when I thought it was this? To get the point across, Isaiah offers us a satire and shares an irony of idolatry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Talking about craftsmen making idols, he reminds them they are but human things, humans making material things. That's why the scripture lesson was so long today, because Sarah had to go through the satire and read all of it so you could understand it. The blacksmith takes the tool and he works it in the coals and he shapes the idol with hammers. He forges it with his mighty arms, and he, he gets hungry, and he loses strength for a while, and he drinks some water, and he grows faint because he's only human. The carpenter measures with a line, and he makes the outline with a marker. He roughs it out, and he chisels it, and he shapes it, perhaps into a human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dwell as a shrine. Isaiah here is saying, you are taking material things, and making them into what you think which will give you spiritual strength. Nothing which we do or make will ever give us the fulfillment as we are when we are worshiping God instead of our idols. Isaiah shows us how absurd idolatry is. I have said this before in many of my sermons that I think that the Bible offers a sense of humor. And here is some humor for you. Picking up in uh, verse 14, here again, starting in 14, Isaiah says, hey, let's take the example of a tree. He cuts down cedars, or perhaps a cypress or an oak. Let it grow among the trees of the forest, or a planted pine, and the rain made it grow. It used as fuel for burning, some of it he takes and warms himself at the kindle of a fire. Oh, and he bakes some bread, yeah, with that tree. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares a meal and he eats it. He also warms himself and says, oh, I'm so warm, I set a fire. From the rest of it, he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it as he worships. He prays to it and says, save me, oh, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over and they cannot see. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even baked some bread over the coals. I roasted meat and I ate it. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes, a deluded heart that misleads them. He cannot save himself or say, it is not this thing in my right hand. Is it not a lie? It's a piece of wood. Water by rain. Did you catch that in the verse? Who brings the rain? God. It came from God. Who created the trees? God. Who made the rain to let the trees grow? God. Friends, when we put all our energy into idols, whatever they are, they will eventually disappoint us. Psalm 16, 4 reminds us, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. Idolatry will sicken our souls as they give us false sense of strength. It is like the midday candy bar, I write in my sermon here, that gives you energy. Uh, I have a bag of Snickers at my office. Of course, they're the fun size one. I don't you know, think I'm a glutton, but I have my little Snicker bar in the afternoon, and I pop it in, and it gives me a sugar rush, and I'm like, okay, I can go. But... What happens after that candy rush 
falls away, you're still hungry. Actually, you feel hungrier, I think, when I snack during the day like that, when I eat on sugary things. I was never satisfied. Eventually, they will fail you because they are addictions. But here's the good news. Ah, we get to the good news. The God who created us, created us to live for him. The God who created us, who created me and, and you and you and you. He created you to live for him. Our salvation only comes through knowing our Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit who is with each and every one of us this moment, right here and now. This is how you will experience salvation. Ah, we finally get to Megan's favorite Bible verse. Offering forgiveness to Israel. For it's idol worship that we hear these words from God through Isaiah 44, 22. He writes, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like that morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, your earth beneath you, bursting into song, you mountains, you forests, and all the trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob, another name for Israel. He dis displays his glory in all Israel. May we give thanks today for this lesson, friends. May we give thanks for our one and only God that loves us so much that he sees our foolishness and still offers us redemption. He says to us, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, 